this talk is about synthesis. That's the main keyword. Uh, so let's jump right in. Um, the goal of this uh, research that I'm going to tell you about is to remove barriers to effective synthesis um, so that any scientist can ask better questions faster. That's the overall goal. And what I mean by synthesis, um, there's a technical way to talk about it and an intuitive way to talk about it. The technical term is uh, just to refer to creating a new innovative conceptual whole and concrete examples might be a theory, a model, design spaces. Um, intuitively, you can think about this as what lit reviews should be, but not, but are not always. Um, giving you a really good sense of this is where the open problems are and um, providing you with a path forward to ask better questions. One concrete example of this that I really like is uh, Esther Duflo, um, who was the recent uh, Nobel Prize winner for economics and credited a synthesis uh, that she got in a handbook chapter that kind of laid out the land of uh, development economics in terms of the open problems and really gave her a leg up to really think about how does she innovate in terms of uh, field experiments to really push the field forward. And, and um, this was in response to um, people asking her, how do you find the right questions? And this was our answer. Uh, so I really want more of this to happen, like since this is really powerful. Um, on the flip side, um, without effective synthesis, I see this all the time, we risk wasting our time on questions that are trivial, um, impossible, um, or misframed. And uh, one of my favorite uh, descriptions of why we need synthesis uh, comes from CMU's own Alan Newell, uh, this favorite, famous phrase, you can't play 20 questions with nature and wind. You got to have some kind of synthesis, some kind of theory. Um, a concrete example of this recently uh, was a paper in PNAS about brain training research and how um, it's an example of how to play 20 questions with nature and lose <laughs> because we're lacking uh, good theory. Um, the problem that we're facing is that synthesis is really hard. So systematic reviews are one kind of synthesis and they're really, really, really hard. And they're fairly narrow, so they tend to focus on just one relationship. Um, but it's so hard that you know most reviews are actually outdated pretty quickly after they get published and they never get updated. Uh, and this is to me a lower bound on the cost of sense making for synthesis because systematic reviews again are very very narrow. Whereas the kind of synthesis that you're probably familiar with as uh, interdisciplinary HCI people, typically a lot more complex, lots of different heterogeneous evidence. Um, there's no single place to, to draw the studies from. You have to kind of piece that whole puzzle together. It's really, really difficult. Um, again, talking about systematic reviews, one of the uh, one of my favorite paper titles is uh, this cognitive work analysis of medical systematic reviews talking about the experience of doing synthesis as being enslaved to the trap data. There's, there's so much good stuff in the papers and it just takes a long time to get stuff out so that you can finally do the thing you want to do. Um, so this is also getting harder. Uh, um, so we all know this, uh, you can stand on the shoulders of giants, you got to climb out the backs and the greater the body of knowledge, the harder this climb becomes. Um, and it's even harder when uh, you know you can't just scope things to a single discipline. Um, again, you're familiar with this. Um, a lot of the problems that we care about um, require you to synthesize across disciplines. So now on to sort of more specifically, my bet uh, of why it's so hard to synthesize is to kind of take a lens of, let's look at the infrastructure that we have. Is it tuned for the thing you want to do synthesis? And my conjecture is that it's, is that it's not. The, the scholarly communication infrastructure that we all operate on, Google Scholar, um, all of our journals, they're all operating on a unit of analysis that isn't good for synthesis. You and I, when we're doing synthesis, we care about ideas. We care about claims, arguments, we're tracing theories, we're supporting them with findings and discourse relations between these ideas, support, opposition, replication, contradiction. That's the meat and potatoes, that's the, the bread and butter of synthesis. Um, that's the actual thing that we want to operate on. Instead, we get documents as the primary unit and metadata about the documents and article types. Um, I can think about this as iTunes for papers, um, and it's not very effective. Uh, so if you think about like, let's say you want to understand, um, you know, what's the effect of bans on hate speech, right? Is it effective? Um, you know, there's probably some more sophisticated queries I could do, but the first place people normally go to is Google Scholar and Semantic Scholar and things like that. 
And theories, evidence, problems, solutions, claims, findings, those are absent, right? They're just not there. They're, um, the, the, the primary unit that we are focusing on is, is the document, right? We've got each, each result is a paper. We've got citations, metadata about papers. We've got gear, we've got authors, that kind of stuff. But you ultimately don't care about that stuff primarily. That's context for the main event, which is the ideas. Same thing with Semantic Scholar. The result of this, again, going circling back to synthesis being hard, um, here's a graph of the breakdown of the tasks of systematic reviewing. And if you look here closely, just look at the colors for a second, right? Um, so this stuff is, um, that's fine. This green stuff is searching, right? Because you have to screen things uh, because papers often don't have the actual result that you want. Um, so this is searching, this is screening, this blue stuff here is extracting the thing you care about, which is the result and the context behind it. All this overhead, roughly half or more of the time you're spending, is just essentially working around the broken infrastructure. I was at a workshop this past summer for uh, international collaboration for automation of systematic reviews. And this was a meme that came out of a discussion about like, what are we doing here? We're building all these tools to like um, try to synthesize what we know about some domain. And we're sort of slapping uh, a Band-Aid on top of a broken scholarly communication infrastructure that just isn't operating the thing we want. It's prim primarily about the document, but what we want is the ideas. So we're coping with this for now, I think. Um, you know, we're spending more time. Scientists are increasingly getting older when they win a Nobel Prize, coping with this interdisciplinary burden of knowledge. Um, we're doing more and more of our science in teams, which is great, um, but teams have their own overhead. Um, at the aggregate level, there's uh, kind of the economics of science and innovation starting to track um, diminishing returns on investment as well. Um, I'm not sure how long we can sustain this, and I'm not keen to stick around to find out. Uh, and so that's the big problem, right? That's the, the, the big context, right? How can we accelerate scientific discovery by lowering barriers to synthesis. Today, uh, the roadmap, I want to take you through this idea of a discourse graph as like an alternative information model that we can build a better infrastructure around. And then we're going to bring it into the home of HCI, right? Why don't we have that right now? There's an authorship bottleneck. So I'm going to talk about like how, why that's the case. And then the main event is um, this the line of research that uh, I've been working on. Um, on this idea of scholar-powered contributions as a sustainable authorship model for discourse graphs. So that's the game plan. Let's talk about discourse graphs, right? So um, a reasonable visual, it's discourse graphs is an unfamiliar term, uh, but I use it specifically to distinguish from the I, broader idea of knowledge graphs, which tends to refer to very domain-specific ontologies and where you have like concepts and, and then ontological relationships like parent of, um, you know, author, that kind of stuff, uh, or causes. Um, here, this is a graph where the nodes are statements, discourse, and the relationships are discourse relations like support, opposition, informing. And you will have like elements like questions, right? Are bans an effective way to mitigate anti-social behavior in online forums? Claims, these are statements about what we believe to be the case. And they can be theories, they can be elements of theories. And then evidence, these are the greens here, where these are specific results from particular studies, right? And they will they need to be contextualized by methodological details like what was the setting? This was on two subreddits, what was the measure? Um, what was the actual result? What was the effect size? Okay. Uh, the what I want you to grok is the overall sense of these elements being statements and there being different kinds of nodes, but not too many, right? There's questions, there's claims, and there's evidence. Hold on to this picture in your head between these grays and these greens. That distinction is going to turn out to be super important um, as in terms of the information model. So I want to give you an intuition about why we think this is useful, right? So beyond it being a face valid match to what we actually say we want, which is the, to work with ideas, um, we can sort of draw on a lot, bunch of really interesting theory across disciplines to think, well, if we had something like this, this, this is the things that we could, we could get out of it, right? So I think of like three Cs of what it supports, compression, contextualizability, and composability. 
In terms of compression, the intuition is um, that this supports finding and manipulating more granular compressed units like claims, not just whole papers, right? So on the left here is like a whole paper, right? Exploring the relationship between personal and public annotations. It will contain a bunch of claims and statements that will be the building blocks, proper building blocks of your theories or your synthesis. Something like most private annotations are not useful to other people. That's the kind of the right unit of analysis as opposed to like the whole paper. Um, and, <clears throat> you know, there's grounding in terms of uh, informatics research and information models, thinking about scholarly argumentation is really operating on atomic statements and concepts as fundamental units. But also from the creativity literature, we see people breaking ideas down into more atomic units so they can recombine them in interesting ways. And that turns out to be quite important as uh, thinking about synthesis as a creative reinterpretation of a, a body of knowledge to facilitate uh, more discovery. In terms of contextualizability, um, you know, often this bare statement isn't super useful. Um, often when you're doing synthesis, you want to ask, how was most measured? What kind of annotations on what kind of content? What people, how many? All these details will be useful for you to kind of arbitrate between opposing claims and opposing evidence, right? And so again, this distinction between, we don't wanna just have bare statements. We also wanna have nodes in the graph that are richly contextualized. They are at the right level of um, you know, context, they are evidence. Um, you know, lots of really current examples of how this has played out, right? This uh, debate about vaccination transmission effects. Um, you know, the details of where the study was happening, it turns out to be very important to try to sort out what's going on. With kids and COVID, this is a personal interest to me as a parent of young children. Um, the literature has uh, it's turned out to be super important to dig into studies uh, in terms of the, how they cut off, like what, what counts as children. Turns out in many hospitals, uh, 18 and under equals children, but it turns out that the relationship between age and uh, COVID risk is a lot more granular than that. And so that turns out to be really important to to kind of distinguish between people saying kids are just the same as adults versus kids are different from adults. That's too high level. You have to sort of dig into the context. Same thing with diversity in teams and lots of other examples. And the grounding for this uh, comes from a variety of places where we see uh, if you observe scholars' behavior, they constantly reread during a lit review. Um, in the sense-making literature, you have this iterative loops of reinterpreting data in light of evolving schemas. So you don't just operate at the schema level, but you have to kind of unpack the data and reinterpret it in light of the schemas. Same thing in CSCW, tons and tons of research on knowledge repositories and how when you want to reuse information for someone else, it has to be recontextualized with details like authorship and the history of changes and things like that. Um, so these are the conceptual grounding behind needing to have contextualizability. Um, one interesting thing that I'll uh, kind of spend a little bit more time later is like uh, desire paths towards contextualizability. It turns out there's a whole uh, user user niche body of uh, repurposing qualitative data analysis software um, like NVivo for literature reviewing for the purpose of being able to do this kind of recontextualization of like keeping the excerpts grounded in the sources uh, while making sense of them. And the last bit is uh, kind of the intuition that you want to have a way to compose things, right? So these this relations turn out to be important, be able to say there's a chain of evidence, there's um, a body or a theory, there's a system of claims, things like that, to be able to construct more structured representations, um, like arguments, causal graphs, and timelines. Um, and this kind of grounding is in the sense-making literature where um, people want often to go beyond simple clusters or groupings of things to more structured representations. So that's the intuition behind why we might want this cross cross, right? So the main problem here um, is uh, we have this wonderful body of work um, in terms of technical standards and infrastructures for um, discourse graphs. We've got um, standards like nano publications, micro publications, research objects, a whole body of work here. Then you can think about it as building the warehouses and the problem being that they're mostly empty right now. So even the, the makers of these standards are lamenting, we want an ocean of nano publications, but at the moment, this is no more than a puddle. Very sad, right? We would love for it to work. We need, we need to actually have uh, a commons and libraries of these things, but we don't. Um, 
one of the main ways that people have attacked this is trying to think of specialized curator models, right? Can we get crowdsource or um, training citizen scientists or uh, hire lots of people to do this? And these often run into uh, scaling issues, sustainability issues, right? So one prominent recent example that makes me very sad, Mark to Cure was a wonderful effort to, um, to annotate the scientific literature for, uh, for a specific disease. And they had to shutter their doors because they just couldn't get enough coverage and enough sustainability. Um, other platforms have similar issues. We have 90 active users on uh, research objects hubs. And for nano publications, the servers have 10 million nano publications, uh, but they're almost all within bioinformatics and they're overwhelmingly dominated by 41 authors. This is pretty common in the, in the area of these infrastructures. On the flip side, text mining. Um, I'm not betting on it yet. Um, so there's a recent kind of study of uh, question answering over research papers. And um, I'll let you sort of look it up on yourself. But uh, one of the main things that I'm seeing is that extractive, um, abstractive summaries of research papers is really hard. Um, if you pay attention to these columns, uh, you know, the human lower bound is, you know, roughly on the order of 40 to 60% accuracy. Uh, and we're in the teens for abstractive summaries uh, for even the, the most complex models right now. Um, so it's still very, very hard, very open problem. Um, and another thing that makes me nervous is that um, we still don't fully understand the properties of uh, the most uh, powerful models we have, like transformer language models. Um, we have a recent paper talking about how, you know, as performance increases overall, uh, um, as models get larger, sometimes they actually get less truthful. Um, they kind of reproduce some of the uh, BS that they're learning from large corpora. And so uh, that also makes me nervous. Um, so the, the concept that I want you to put in your head is this idea of scholar power contributions, right? Think about it as an HCI problem, right? So not a, what if we thought about this as a HCI problem instead of an incentive problem or a NLP problem, right? How do we build socio-technical systems that um, enable this authorship to happen? Uh, a key inspiration for this is this idea of integrated organic crowdsourcing uh, that I started working on at CMU uh, with Steven when he was here. Um, we had this idea of, you know, in large scale collaboration communities, innovation communities, you have a ton of ideas and we need to have a structure for it. And it's very annoying to get crowdsourced judgments of similarity between ideas. But it turns out that people like to cluster things on whiteboards, naturally. And so we take that information that we don't have to ask them to do it, they naturally do it. And then we use that to uh, estimate semantic similarity and then we turn that into an idea map, right? The key thing was finding this design pattern of the task that they're intrinsically motivated to do and integrating into it as opposed to getting them to do some separate task. Um, Christoph, uh, who we did this work with, gave this entire talk on organic crowdsourcing with recommend you check it out. I think the recording is still live. Uh, so this is 2015. Uh, the overall vision is expansive and very inspiring to me. And this is what I'm explicitly building on. Um, so specifically, I'm interested in integrating into individual collaborative synthesis practices, right? Things that are people already doing in terms of their synthesis. Why? Um, I think there's a significant untapped creative exhaust, right? Intuitively, people are doing this all the time already, right? As you read papers, you are pulling out claims, statements, evidence for your thinking, for your colleagues, right? Just to give you like some rough order of magnitude numbers, we don't actually know the exact numbers, right? How many faculty are there? How many papers are there? We don't really know the exact numbers, but order of magnitude, they're comparable, right? Um, you know, by varying estimates, we have, you know, roughly uh, one and a half million to maybe two million uh, researchers. And they say that they read like, you know, <laughs> Uh, you know, a couple hundred papers a year, who knows what the real number is, but I think order of magnitude is about right, like a couple hundred million uh, papers read per year. And compare that to, you know, by varying estimates, we have on that same order of magnitude total papers ever published. So this is not ridiculous, right? We're not asking like 50 people to annotate, you know, 500,000 things, right? The, 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 it sort of matches in terms of the, the amount of work being done. And I'm also... There's other ways of doing scholar power contributions that say, let's change the way people publish uh, as a social tech 
technical guy, I'm very nervous about that. Uh, there's a lot of entrenched constraints and incentives. And so um, as we'll see, uh, I'll show you in a bit, uh, there's a lot of interesting uh, variety in the tools that people are using, lots of appetite for exploration. So I find that a more interesting test bit. Okay, so um, the basic concept, right, is we give people the tools to build their own personal discourse graph for themselves. We give them the tools to share and federate with others that they know. We're not asking them to crowdsource to some unknown scientific community. And then over time, as this gains steam, we figure out how to aggregate into a decentralized commons of discourse graphs. That's the general path that I'm betting on. And there are kind of two research questions that I'll talk to you about in terms of uh, progress, right? So the first one is, um, you know, is this even feasible? Are there, are there integration points for authoring discourse graphs, right? Is there something similar to that whiteboard thing that people are already doing? And then is it social technically possible to integrate authoring of shareable discourse graphs, right? It could be that people can do it for themselves, but none of it's gonna be intelligible to anyone else. And then we're back at square one, right? So these are the two kind of research questions of this uh, body of work. I'll quickly tell you about the first one, right? In terms of other integration points for authoring this source graph. So very quickly, uh, we've done a bunch of formative studies uh, of scholarly synthesis practices. We've done think aloud protocols of scholars. We put GoPro in their heads for four hours, uh, distributed across multiple sessions to see what they actually do. Uh, we've done in-depth contextual interviews with scholars about the synthesis process. And we've done participant observation, very, very large distributed communities of uh, people um, using different tools for thought. And I'll show you um, the main thing that we're interested in is, you know, um, we've talked about this like um, affordances of compression, contextualizability, composability. Can we see some of that happening already? Is this something that people want to do? Is there intrinsic motivation and in existing integration points? <clears throat> um, so I'm going to talk to you about, uh, you know, very quickly show you three kind of personas that we've, we've, we've seen in, across our, our studies. Um, we, talk, we can see them as uh, virtuosos, explorers, and hackers. Uh, so virtuosos, uh, we think of them as uh, the largest user base. They're uh, people who use uh, existing tools like OneNote and Word, and they use it really well. They employ very sophisticated practices and conventions in traditional tools to enable compression, contextualizability, and composability. One concrete example is people using highlight different colors for highlighting, right? It turns out this is very widespread practice. People kind of uh, wanting to break down papers into actual units like um, blue is like a finding, green is an author, yellow is um, a piece of context, red is a problem, right? People have these fairly consistent practices that they do as well. Um, and they have these structured summaries that they write, uh, maybe more when you're a grad student versus later on. But nevertheless, there's this is going on. This is happening. Uh, people are, you know, specifying structured relationships between things, and they're trying to make sure that they have the context uh, recorded for the things that they're writing about. All right. So this is happening amongst virtuosos, right? Using tools like you can see OneNote, you can see Google Docs, Word, things like that. We also see uh, a growing body of explorers adopting niche tools with powerful novel affordances because they want compression, contextualizability, and composability, right? So I'm not sure if you've seen uh, Liquid Text uh, came out of a research project at Georgia Tech. One of my favorite examples of a good PDF reader that understands that people want to pull out these elements, right, as their own units that you can manipulate and um, link to other things independently, right? So compression contextualizability, right? If you click on this thing, you jump back to the context and composability, being able to link them together independently, right? This is a huge draw of the tool like Liquid Text. Um, I already told you about NVivo, right? It turns out some of our participants did use NVivo, right? For those purposes as well, because they want a, a way to, again, return to the context again and again, and be able to manipulate these granular units separately from the paper. Um, you can sort of use is the affordances of qualitative coding to look around the context of things that you've kind of excerpted, right? Um, and then other people are sort of doing this kind of network notebook digital garden thing, which I'll show you a concrete example of in a second, right? They kind of the next coming of wikis, personal wikis, right? Having these individual notes that they can link together. Some of them, they make it public uh, in what they call digital gardens, right? They're trying to get compression down, uh, being able to compose things into networks and things like that. 
Um, and then we also have hackers, right? So uh, your classic uh, org mode has been extended to do bi-directional linking is called org roam, uh, inspired by some recent uh, tools uh, where they're trying to lean more into this composability of having networks, uh, notes, right? Having the ability to see backlinks and the relationship between your notes. Um, we have people right, in, in org roam, uh, Org mode, I think, org mode classic has an extension that allows you to read PDFs uh, in org mode and be able to jump back to the context of your annotations, right? So instead of having this like decontextualized snippet, you click on the on the snippet and you jump back to the context to enable this kind of rereading behavior. Um, lots of innovation in Zotero, right? Having this ability to extract uh, annotations from your PDF so you can uh, also have those links back to the source. Uh, source context. So very, that's a super quick tour to just give you a sense that there are a lot of rich integration points for discourse graph authoring, right? Lots of people, uh, virtuosos doing sophisticated practice and conventions, uh, explorers using niche tools, and hackers creating homespun system enhancements and whole systems to do uh, compression, contextualizability, and composability. That's exciting. Uh, there's a potential test bit to integrate into. Right, again, the idea of the whiteboards, it's happening. There's a persistent problem, uh, right? As we look at this, you, you'll see the sense, right? There's so much local variation, right? Lots of personal contextual idiosyncratic practices. Is it possible to bridge that so that there's some kind of, some degree of standardization and reliable capture? So that's the problem they're working on the technical side, right? Is it socio-technically possible to integrate authoring of shareable discourse graphs? So here we get to an exciting part of the talk where uh, I'm going to do a uh, live demo of what this looks like. Um, so what you're looking at here is one of the network notebooks uh, that we've identified in our participant observations called Rome Research. Um, so the first thing I'll show you is, well, what is Rome? It's basically a cross between an outliner, like Workflowy, if you've seen it, and a wiki, right? where you can take notes in atomic blocks and pages, right? That can be linked to each other in nonlinear structures, right? So for example, this is a link to a block of text from a different page, right? This is a uniquely addressable thing. Um, and you can link to a page just like a wiki, right? This is another page uh, that has content in it. And it links back, right? So if you go back to, if you go to this page, uh, you can sort of look at other things that link to this page as well, which is, again, if you know the history of wikis, that's a basic kind of wiki feature of backlinks. There's a lot more to it. The important thing to think about is that underneath this uh, note-taking interface is a actual graph database. And that's what we're going to leverage um, to be able to allow people to write close to prose, uh, but also author uh, a discourse graph that's shareable um, in the background. OK. so. Uh, I've got this thing in the sidebar, right? So I told you roughly what Rome is. Um, let's let's look at how we could write close to prose and be able to translate that to something shareable, like a discourse graph. So on the left here, you can see this is kind of like a Google Doc, right? We've got this title. This is a question, right? How susceptible are young children to COVID-19 infection? And we've got a bunch of sources, right? We've collected all these papers that we need to read, right? So what do we do? Um, it, we can define a workflow that is not too different from what you might see people do, where you might go to say, okay, right now I'm going to read this paper um, and I'm going to take some notes on it, right? So you look at the sections here, right? What are the aims of this paper? What do they do? What does this paper contribute to our question? These are all like, you, you should recognize that this looks similar to the structured summary I just showed you earlier. This is not an unfamiliar task and people want to do this. Right, so you can take notes on the aims, you can take notes on the methods, all that good stuff. And then you can say, well, okay, what does this paper contribute to our question? The main result is meta-analysis of 11 household transmission studies estimated two times lower susceptibility. Great, what do we do with this? It turns out it could be useful in people's workflows to mark that as an individually addressable thing Here is a piece of evidence, right? So you can use the extension to say, hey, extension, mark this as a piece of evidence, okay? And that creates a page where it's of type evidence 
And now it's individually addressable. You can sort of see, um, you can link to it elsewhere independently of this paper itself. You might do that, for example, in an outline that you're writing as an answer to this question, right? So here are the sources. And there's a section here for synthesis, right? So we could say, okay, well, one people, one, one reasonable part is that children are the same as adults, and there's evidence here. And then maybe there's another growing body of evidence that children are actually less likely to contract COVID given a current exposure. And you can say, okay, here's the case for this claim. I'm gonna dump all the evidence here. And you can say, okay, here's all this evidence I have so far. I just read this, this new thing and say uh, more from a meta analysis and you can link to it independently from the paper itself, right? And so now this thing is here, right? And we also have the reference context. So all the information, the rich contextual information is easily available, right? You can see the actual uh, result here that we captured. Now that you've done that, actually, it gets even more interesting, right? So um, now the system recognizes there's a latent relationship between this evidence and the claim that I was talking about, right? The discourse context, it knows that this evidence informs this question and supports this claim. Um, it's recognizing the pattern of writing of indentation and sections and saying, okay, there's this relationship here. Um, we can talk about the technical uh, reasons behind that in a second, but just for now, I can just see like it's recognizing these patterns of writing, right? Um, you can do all kinds of other interesting things with that. Um, so I'm gonna close this for now and I'm going to close this out, right? You could, for example, go to like a whiteboard, right? And um, you can say, I'm trying to make sense of this like children and COVID thing, right? And then now you can say, let me query my discourse graph, right? Let me find all the evidence where the evidence informs this question, right? And then out comes all the evidence that relates to this. And you can start making sense of it. Um, this is kind of like a visual discourse graph, right? So you can put this in here and you can say, ah, this looks like there. Oh, there are no relationships between that. That's fine. Um, so you can say maybe this uh, supports that, right? Things like that. Um, and what's cool is that each of these are now not just like decontextualized nodes, but they're actually, um, you know, clickable and so you can call up the context while you're trying to think about, um, make sense of them. Um, and then, you know, if you want to share that with someone else, rather than sending them a bunch of papers, you can actually export uh, into like a CSV or Markdown. Uh, and, you know, it could come out in like a different app that reads Markdown, for example. Markdown is just plain text. Right. And so here's another network notebook in Obsidian um, that is able to read the export from the discourse graph. Right. And you can see the structure, um, you know, which is retained here. Um, so you can share that with someone else who doesn't use Rome or, um, you know, it's just using, um, you know, Notion or whatever. Markdown is a kind of a nice lingua franca. Right. Um, so that's kind of the the give you a flavor of what it might look like, right? To be able to take notes, um, this again, this is familiar to the explorers and the hackers, but maybe not to the virtuosos as much. But everything I've just showed you are things that people are actually doing in the Rome uh, community. There's like ten to twenty thousand users that are kind of doing things like this. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to here, right? Um, that's the proof of concept, right? So just to draw the key intuitions here, right? So we wanna integrate the formal, this is things that we're, we've been seeing in our formative um, design research while we're developing this extension with uh, our early users, right? They find it very important to integrate the formal into the informal. So they don't have to go to a separate interface to specify a formal discourse graph. It integrates into their own notes as they're writing their outlines for their papers or uh, just taking notes um, alongside the speculation to be able to have um, the system recognize implicit discourse structure and reify that in, into a reusable, shareable, explicit discourse structure um, that has nodes 
and discourse relations that you can share with other people. The other key intuition is to provide immediate intrinsic benefits. Why might you want to create a discourse graph? It allows you to make sense of a larger body of evidence. You can query it. Um, you can share it with someone else. You can export it. And this is just the beginning, right? So once you have a graph, you can sort of use that to help allocate your attention to find interesting speculative claims that have lots of links, but have mixed evidence behind them or compute evidential support across competing claims. Uh, you could have um, your friends subscribe. Uh, let's say you know, I, Chinmai and I are thinking about similar things. And I can say, hey, I want to pull anytime Chinmai um, describes a new piece of evidence that opposes a claim that I hold very dear. Um, you can sort of support those kinds of operations as well once you have that graph structure. Technically speaking, uh, there are three key ingredients. There's a simple convention for note writing that's built again off of that discourse graph information model, right? We have questions, we have claims, we have evidence. It's a small set of nodes. Um, it's a small set of edges. Um, and we have a hypertext notebook. It turns out to be quite important. So I showed you Rome Research. Um, Obsidian was this other tool um, that I showed you. But Notion, TiddlyWiki, LockSec, Foam, RemNote, Emacs, OrgMode, Athens Research, Personal Wiki. There's a growing body of these tools um, that is really exciting right now um, because it's sort of second coming. We have Orgmos, uh, and Emacs, Orgmon, and Tilivik here, so the OG of these uh, kinds of tools, and now it's being democratized. We have, like, uh, I think by my last count, four to five different tools have had raised uh, multiple million dollars of VC funding, uh, kind of marking the interest in this space. Um, so this is, I think this is a growing space where it's not ridiculous to kind of think about these uh, explorers as being able to use tools like this. And then, of course, a simple uh, simple to the user, uh, plug in to parse notes into a discourse graph, right? Um, I didn't show you this, um, but now just to kind of flash it up on the screen, under the hood, there's a user customizable grammar um, that identifies particular kinds of notes and relations. And it's uh, recognizing a actual data log query pattern over the atomic graph database and saying like, when it looks like this, then this evidence supports this claim. And a lot of these come out the box, but um, actually some of our early users have already modified this to say, when I write like this, I mean that this evidence supports this claim, or when I write like that. Um, it's not super user friendly to make this, but we can actually copy paste these patterns with each other, um, which is exciting. Okay, so the summary of this, this line is, you know, it's, I think it's, we have a proof of concept that it's possible to write close to prose and create a shareable discourse graph as a byproduct. Um, we've seen this with uh, people that's not just me, uh, this uh, growing number of users of this uh, beta tool that are actually starting to use this in this way. And I think this opens up new paths to sustainable scholar power authoring. Uh, next steps along this line, uh, more participatory observation in this particular community. Um, I've built these relationships over the last one and a half years. Um, and, you know, there's a Discord where we're sort of administering this as field sites, there's 700 people, um, roughly 18,000 academic users. And uh, right now there's 10 to 20 early testers, lots of excitement. And uh, this guy uh, is partnering with us to uh, integrate this into his course on note-taking for research and academia. And so we'll collect data there too. And, uh, you know, this discourse graph extension is the name of the tool that I just showed you. So we're excited about that. It's launching in the next couple of weeks and we'll sort of build out more of our knowledge of um, whether this bet actually makes sense. Uh, and then from there, you know, expand to other platforms once we figure out the patterns, move from hackers to explorers, maybe to virtuosos. In principle, this is possible in Google Docs or Notion, right? And so people are already asking, like, I don't use Rome. I saw this, it looks cool. Are you going to expand this to other things? So that's the longer game plan uh, to kind of expand this through uh, the variety of user bases. Okay, I want to leave some time for Q&A, so I'll quickly flash this up here, right? Uh, something that you might wonder is like, you know, the discourse graph structure uh, seems like it could benefit from, you know, knowledge graphs tend to be about machine readability, right, and formality. Um, and what I want to say is that, um, you know, we are preserving some minimal amount of formality, but I think it's important that rather than having a knowledge graph that's very strictly ontological as the main thing, we have this sort of boundary objects that are minimally structured, weakly structured, and be able to be more strongly structured in local use, right? Especially if you're doing cross-boundary communication. And then you can 
can integrate formality into your discourse graph as appropriate. You can reference um, you know, entities from, uh, from an ontology if you like, some controlled vocabulary. Uh, but in terms of the common structure, you want to have something that's le less, less strongly structured. So zooming back out, right? Uh, the larger vision of a building block for a new infrastructure beyond iTunes for papers. I think we have got some interesting uh, directions here. Um, honestly, even if we stop at just facilitating step two of sharing with other people within the lab, uh, collaborators, that would be a huge win. Uh, but in terms of scaling up, we want to prioritize is decentralization and federation over centralized uh, uniform one graph for all of science. And um, there's lots of interesting developments in Web3. Decentralized standards exist and hosting uh, approaches where we can sort of have this federated wikis kind of idea where instead of a single graph, we have contextual and contentious um, discourse graphs. And this is consistent with the larger vision from CCW studies of uh, infrastructure, where um, the idea is that lots of times infrastructures are grown instead of design a prior from the top down. We sort of start with the tools and local practices and build that up over time. So that's the long game. So I'll close with a call to action. Uh, and I think there's a really interesting space for HCI to really help with science reform and open access, open science, right? Um, a lot of the technical uh, you know, infrastructure already exists and other people are working on the incentives there's a lot of space for innovation on the HCI side. How do we design these social technical um, service design uh, interfaces uh, to really make it possible for people to uh, turn their values into action, right? If you think about a pyramid, you make it possible, you make it easy, and then that allows communities to make it normative, and then you can make it required. It's, I'm nervous about starting with policy and science reform and saying top down, you need to X without a good way for people to actually do what you want. That could lead to all kinds of, uh, to me, um, you know, net, net harm. So people sort of going by the letter of the law instead of the spirit of the law. So I think there's a lot of role for HCI in helping with science reform uh, that I think is underexplored. And I'd like to encourage you to consider that. Okay. So that's it for uh, what I've prepared. Um, just to quickly summarize, right? We have this wrong unit of analysis that it's my diagnosis for synthesis being hard. We have discourse graphs and the lack of sustainable means of authoring and a potentially new pattern for sustainable authorship with scholar powered um, contributions. So with that, I'm looking forward to uh, the discussion. <laughs>